March 15, 2018. My name is John Michael. I work with the Metro Codes Department and I'll be making the presentation of all the cases for the board's consideration today. We always ask at the beginning of each meeting, please turn off your phone, please turn off your tablet, please turn off any other children's toys or loud noise making devices because there is a limitation on time for presentation for each of the cases. We wanna make sure there's nothing done that would interrupt those uh, presentations to the board or their deliberation. Naturally, thank you in advance for your help with that matter. Um, for today's public hearings, the board will review the entirety of the case file. That'll consist of everything from the photographs, site plans, maps, and other documents that comprise that case record. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies and or elected officials as appropriate. At the conclusion of the staff's presentation of the case, uh, case file, the appellant will have the opportunity to make his or her presentation to the board. After the appellant's presentation, the board would hear from any of those wishing to speak in support of the appeal. Then if there is opposition present, the board would hear from those parties. Upon completion of opposition testimony, the board would then hear uh, rebuttal testimony from the appellant if they've chosen to leave some of their originally allotted time to do so. Under BZA rules, the appellant has five minutes for a presentation if no opposition is present. For contested cases, both sides have 10 minutes to make their desired presentations. Should the appellant wish to provide rebuttal testimony, he or she should reserve some portion of that originally allotted 10 minutes. To be very, very clear, as we do have some crowded cases today, that's 10 shared minutes. Not everybody gets 10 minutes to bite at the apple. One apple, 10 minutes total. So divvy up your time accordingly. At the conclusion of each hearing, our board will deliberate and then vote on the case in question. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, specifically 17.40.180. All of the section numbers to which we refer today come from the Metro Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of uh, the Metropolitan Government. The Zoning Code was adopted in its current form by the Metro Council and became effective on July the 1st, 1998, with many, many, many amendments that have taken place since then. I'll introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it part of today's record. The Metro Code also requires a record of these proceedings. Because the BZA meetings are recorded for public television, it is imperative that anybody wishing to address the board come forward, take a seat at the front table, and use the microphone to address yourself or introduce yourself by name and address, and then make the desired presentation to the board. It's worthy of note that any comments from the gallery, besides being forbidden, will not be part of the public record, will not do anything to help or harm a case. The Metro Code requires four of our seven board members in order to establish quorum. We expect to have exactly four for today's hearings. In the event that someone has to leave, falls ill, has a child that needs to be picked up from school, and we lose quorum, that will, by law, end the meeting at that time. Any cases that have not been heard at that time will be continued to the top of our next docket, which is set to take place on April the 5th, 2018. In the event that five or more members are present for a case and an appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Any application that fails to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of a public hearing shall be deemed denied by operation of law. Because we have four members present today, each of the cases before the board will require four affirmative votes to establish passage of the appeal sought. Person to board rules an aggrieved party may appeal any decision or action by the Board of Zoning Appeals. Such appeal should be filed to the Chancery Court within 60 days of the original hearing date. <coughs> Additionally, an aggrieved party may file a motion for a rehearing within 60 days of the original hearing date. Thank you. Pursuant to the uh, rules and regulations or rules of procedure for the Board of Zoning Appeals. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final. No further legal action can be taken. For the appellants, if your appeal is granted, you are in fact required to obtain the permit that you seek within two years. Failure to do so within that timeline then removes the approval from the BZA and requires you to go back to the start of the process. Additionally, it should be noted that if any false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, good day. I submit that all the cases have been filed in the proper order. Appellants have been sent the certified mail regarding today's hearing dates and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. I would note two important preliminary announcements for today's proceedings. First, case number 53 involving the property at 2124 Wooddale Lane has been deferred to April the 5th, our next docket. Again, that's case 53, deferred one meeting to April the 5th. Additionally, because the board is benefiting from testimony from planning staff on two sidewalk appeals today, 
we would ask the board to move cases number 63 and 64 to the top of the docket so that you can have the testimony from planning staff on those two cases above and beyond what you have in the recommendations. Again, that's case 2018-63 involving the property at 2909 12th Avenue South and its sidewalk variance request and case 28064 involving the property at 3813 Elkins Avenue involving its uh, request for a sidewalk variance. Uh, absent any objection from the board, those will be the first two cases presented by staff today. Very, very good. For the members of the public and for our board, it's worthy to note that our board utilizes a consent agenda. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to today's hearings and identifies the cases where the appellants have met the criteria needed for an approval of their uh, requested action. If the reviewing board member determines that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts, then the case is recommended to the board for its approval on this consent agenda. We'll enter into the record those cases that have been so identified. If anyone is here in opposition to one of the specifically identified cases from this consent agenda, please raise your hand when I call that case. Uh, make sure that I see your hand when I call that case, and we'll remove it from the consent agenda, just making sure that the case is heard in its regular order. The following cases have been identified for today's consent agenda. First, case number 2018-036. This involves a property at 1436 Heil Quaker Boulevard in Council District number 33, and a request for a variance from sidewalk requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 36? Seeing none. The next case so recommended is case number 2018-040, involving the property at 757 Darden Place. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 40? You are, very well. That case will be removed from the consent agenda and heard in its regular order. The next case on consent agenda is number 2018-042, involving the property at 503 Spruce Street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 42? Seeing none, Mr. Chairman. Next, case number 2018-048, involving the property at 294B McGavick Pike, a variance from sidewalk requirements for an alternative construction. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 48? There is. That case will be removed from the consent agenda and heard in its regular order. Next, case number 2018-049, involving the property at 2 Fern Avenue, units A and B. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 49? Seeing none. Next, case number 2018-052, a case involving the property at 4920, sorry, that's 4920 Indiana Avenue. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 52? Very well. That case will be removed from the consent agenda and heard in its regular order. Next is case number 2018-55, involving the property at 2949 Nolensville Pike. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 55? Seeing none, the next case identified for the consent agenda is case 2018-056, involving the property at 908 Lishy Avenue. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 56? Seeing none, the next case identified for consent agenda is number 2018-059, involving the property at 65 Willow Street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 59? Seeing none, the next case identified for consent agenda is case number 2018-060 involving the property at 7025 Charlotte Pike. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 60? Seeing none, the last case identified for the consent agenda is 2018-062 involving the property at 525 Basswood Avenue. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 62? Seeing none, the recap, Mr. Chairman, for the proposed consent agenda is case number 2018-36, case number 2018-42, case 2018-49, case 2018-55, case 2018-56, case 2018-59, case 2018-60, and case 2018-62. A final note, Mr. Chairman, before we solicit a motion and vote on that consent agenda, for the ones that are sidewalk requirements, it is of course noted that the uh, 
consent agenda and passage is predicated upon following the recommendations of the planning department, which have been submitted in writing before today's hearings. Okay, very good. That is the consent agenda. Any questions about it? It's been moved properly. Is there a second? second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Mr. Chairman, absent any other uh, questions from the board, we will take up those cases that we identified to take up earlier so, than otherwise so scheduled. let's dismiss the, the, the folks that don't want to be here for four hours or five Well, hours. Mr. Chairman, the folks who don't want to be here, I'm afraid no one would leave if we said it that way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you are part of one of the cases that just passed on consent agenda, you're done. You're welcome to stay. However, the uh, passage has been granted and you're able to uh, go ahead and make the rest of your day if need be. Obviously, Mr. And, Chairman, we'd like to use this uh, preliminary yeah. portion of today's Bef hearings. Before, to before before we talk about, uh, hear from our great elected officials, I'd like to say something about Nashville. So as you know, we have a new mayor of Nashville, David Briley, who um, has been in front of this board before. He's a native Nashvillian. The power of the city uh, transitioned very smoothly last week, and um, the city is in good hands. Um, we are all here as appointments of various mayors, and so um, this is how metro government works, and um, I'm glad that, you know, although it was kind of a surprise for a lot of people, the city is going to be well run, especially from the many thousands and thousands of hardworking metro employees, too, that really make metro work. So, thank you. Mr. Chairman, we'd like to use this opportunity to recognize the elected officials who are with us today to speak on various cases before the board. Um, give them an opportunity to address the board here at the outset of the meeting, if they wish, with regard to the cases of interest for them. Uh, to begin, we're delighted to have State Representative Beck with us today. Representative, do you wish to come forward and address the board at this time? Very well, Representative Beck. We have a pecking order. If you're in the legislature, you get to go first. Isn't Rep that great? Representative Beck, <laughs> I welcome. appreciate that. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. Uh, I'm here today as a resident of Madison. I'm here today as a former uh, president of the Madison Chamber of Commerce. I'm here today for my constituents in District House District 51. Ladies and gentlemen, on item number 13, page 6 in your agenda is the proposal to put a waste transfer station in my drive quarter ladies and gentlemen as y'all as you as you will see when you look at the map of where they're planning to put this it, it has a very little road frontage goes back to a, a narrow uh goes to a narrow lot it opens up on the end and the one of the many problems with this is it backs up to a neighborhood uh, of, of residential properties. The spirit of the law, and as you all know at the Capitol, we're always talking about the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law in Metro is that there are buffer zones for landfills, for uh, gravel pits, for other highly industrial uh, uses that can cause noxious odors, can cause uh, infestation of, of bugs, mosquitoes, all different types of health hazards. That is the spirit of the law for the buffer. This is not in that buffer, unfortunately, because it's technically not a landfill. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, it is a landfill. It is a landfill in that we don't know, they say that they're gonna take the trash off every day. What if it's six, what if a truck comes in uh, to dump their trash uh, late in the afternoon? It'll sit there overnight. What if it's late on a Friday? It'll sit there over the weekend. The, we should not have to subject our residents and our citizens of Madison to a noxious, um, type of business or business transaction that this company is, this, is trying to place in this Madison corridor. 
Madison is a warm and welcoming place. We have our share of, uh, we have a convenience center right down from there. We have a sewer plant right down from there. We have a recycling plant right down from there. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been warm and welcoming as far as we can go. So we're not saying that we're trying to keep people from, uh, we understand that, that Nashville has needs as far as um, our utilities and our trash and things like this. But ladies and gentlemen, this is a horrible plan. It is a plan that will, is a detriment to our neighbors, to our industrial neighbors. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a plant, a manufacturing plant that is scheduled to be built near this. They are gonna withdraw and move. Good jobs, good paying jobs. What we're trying to develop in Madison are gonna leave. We're gonna lose other great uh, employers that are also in that corridor. We cannot, for the benefit of a few, destroy what we're trying to do for the many. So we ask that you, when you look at this, you understand the totality of what they are asking you to do. I, I, have, the, I, have, I have the faith in the, in the system that we have set up. I know that you will see this for truly what it is. And for the sake of, of, of Madison, for the sake of our city, I ask that you turn this away and that you, and you, and that you tell them this is not the place for it and that we already have been over backwards to facilitate the places that we need in, the, in, the, uh, in Madison and in the Myatt corridor. And I thank you for this time. I thank you for being first in the pecking order. And uh, if, I, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Any questions for Repre Representative Beck? We understand, of course, the legislature is still in session, so we really appreciate yes. you being down here. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, we're also joined by a number of Metro Council members today. First, I saw Council Member Nancy Van Rees from the Madison District. Do you wish to address the board beforehand? Oh, the Very pecking well. order. We're going at large first in district. <laughs> and at the request of Council Member Van Rees, we'll hear from Council Member Bob Mendez. Very well. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, Council Member Nancy Van Rees. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here this afternoon on behalf of the folks in District 8 uh, regarding the, the same matter uh, in regard to uh, what's happening uh, near Myatt Drive. Uh, I am uh, apologetic for uh, Council Member Pridemore, who's out of town and unable to be here. And I know that uh, Council Member Mendez is going to speak on his behalf um, later on the agenda. Because of work uh, obligations, I don't know if I can stay that long. I'm going to try, but uh, we'll see where we come up. Uh, but I did want to speak uh, about as a neighboring district. In District 8, uh, as you know, Old Hickory Boulevard cuts to Gallatin Pike and then all the way up um, toward uh, this area off of Myatt. And there is no question in my mind that any trucks going and coming from this area are going to cut through residential neighborhoods in District 8, and that highly concerns me. Uh, I've heard from a number of different folks that live in the area that are equally concerned. Um, those of us both in uh, Districts uh, 7, 8, 9, and 10 uh, that represent that uh, corridor of the Madison area are all equally concerned, and I'm here simply to offer my support uh, to Councilmember Pridemore and his uh, uh, advice in regard to this matter. So thank you very much for the time to do that. Council Lady Van Rees, thank you for being here. Um, you talked about trucks. I wanted to ask you this question so, because you may not be here when it gets called. Um, what's so objectionable about trucks coming through the neighborhood going to well, the Well, we've, we've had a, an ongoing uh, issue in regard to litter in the area that we're making a number of different uh, uh, 
opportunities are in front of us to be able to address. Uh, but whenever you have uh, transfer trucks that are full of garbage going through residential areas, that's never a good idea. Um, we have a number of different uh, problems with uh, open air trucks as well as um, things, you know, kind of leaking out the back of trucks. Um, if w Would you want that to drive down your street on the way? I, I don't think so. So um, we are in the middle of a transition over into the urban service district area and as a newly annexed area, uh, we are gonna have uh, enough of a transition to be able to kind of move through how our recycling and our garbage is going to work. And uh, we want the, the space uh, to be able to do that um, as effectively as possible. Uh, but there's no question in my mind that um, uh, the business and the momentum as uh, 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 Mr. Beck had indicated, uh, the momentum that we have in that area uh, should not be stopped. Um, there is uh, an opportunity that I know that Council Member uh, Mendez is gonna speak to in regard to the legalities of this uh, issue. Um, and uh, I know that uh, we're hoping that on the council level, uh, we'll be able to offer a clear definition as to a way to be able to resolve this in the future. Okay, any questions for Council Lady Van Rees? Okay, thank you for being All right. here. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, we're also joined by Councilmember Mina Johnson from District 23. Councilmember Johnson. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman and Commissioner. Thank you so much for this opportunity and privilege to speak uh, ahead of the agenda. Uh, today, I, um, uh, I'm Mina Johnson representing District 23. So I do have two cases in front of you today, so I will be speaking on both cases. The first case, uh, 2018-040. Uh, this is a front setback variance request uh, for addition to the existing house. I have met with the property owner and reviewed the plan and as well as reviewed the nearby uh, neighbor's support. Uh, what this uh, variance request will do is add less than 10 feet in existing front to have uh, create uh, addition. So in my neighborhood, uh, rhythm of the neighborhood and community character is a very, very important thing. So by adding this addition, uh, we really, did uh, change the character of the neighborhood or the rhythm of the neighborhood. So after meeting with uh, the property owner and personally uh, visited the house, I determined it will not destroy those uh, neighborhood character. Rather, it can be a welcoming addition. For that reason, I will be in support of this variance request. So I'm hoping you will find that uh, grant the variance request as well. Uh, next uh, case I would like to speak is uh, case number 2018-061, uh, your favorite subject, uh, short-term rental. <laughs> And uh, this is a uh, 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 permit revocation. In this case, I would like to appreciate uh, the decision made by your zoning administrator because you know every case is different. And in this case, it is uh, quite a violation involving a police and involving arrest of the occupant. And those things would not happen frequently. And when it's happened, our neighborhood will be, have great concern. So right after this incident had happened, I had several uh, emails from the nearby neighbors. So they are quite upset, naturally, because one, why they do not understand why this kind of commercial business can be allowed in neighborhood residential zoning. And so they understand, you know, uh, <coughs> type one permit which allow home share. So the person owner of the house can be very responsible for the guest. So that type of, you know, permit, they will be somewhat lenient depending on the clientele. But however, if this is a type two permit, th their concern will be raised because it will be so hard to reach out to responsible party. And in this case, I understand uh, the permit is type one. However, 
However, I'm hearing uh, from the neighbor, the owner might not be uh, permanently occupied this uh, residence. Unfortunately, I did not have a chance to speak with the property owner or his representative uh, because he did not reach out to me until after hours uh, yesterday. So I did try to reach out to him uh, today. However, uh, my phone call was uh, was not answered. So I could not hear, you know, exact uh, situation of this case. But however, considering the, uh, you know, degree of the violation, I think this is a great case for you to uphold uh, the decision by zoning administrator. Because we, as a neighbors, are relying on your decision. Because we, it does not matter how much restriction or regulation uh, we make as a council, because we are asking and relying on your power to enforce most important issue. For the neighbors, most, what most important is enforce and enhance quality of life, and which is difficult. So like a short-term rental case, if we can have really responsible property owner, and then we can have harmony with the neighborhood, yes, we can have a great you know, relationship, and it will enhance. However, case like this type of violation, it will be a threat to peace and quiet of the neighborhood. So for that reason, I would ask to uphold the decision of course administrator. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Representative Johnson? Thank you for being here. Thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, we are also joined by our friend Councilmember Scott Davis from District Number Five. Councilman Davis, did you wish to address the board? Five. Okay. And Councilman Brett Withers from District Number Six is also present with us. Councilman Withers. Thank you. Good afternoon, board members. I am uh, Councilmember Brett Withers representing District Six, and I do apologize. I need to mm -hmm. get back to work very, very shortly, so I can't stay for the hearing today. Um, I'm here to speak on two uh, items that are in District 6. The first one, um, I will start with the um, case number 46. This is for property located at 1304 Gartland Avenue in Lachlan Springs. <clears throat> Pardon me. The property owner, owner, Allison Edwards, is present today and had reached out to me uh, quite a while back to give me some information about the case. This is um, a, a, an outbuilding that has been on that site for many, many years. Um, not only, uh, uh, and in fact, it was on that site before the even the neighborhood conservation zoning overlay was uh, applied in the 80s. So it's been there a while, and the property owner wishes to retain that outbuilding and to uh, seek permission to convert that to a uh, detached accessory dwelling unit, um, and it is the case that the um, the outbuilding is quite close to the property line. Uh, however, I uh, do have in my file, and I know that you all do as well, I have a letter from the most affected neighbor next door that they have no objection uh, to retaining the building, um, even though it's close to the property line, as well as to the use of that as a detached accessory dwelling unit. And this structure is quite a bit smaller, in, in fact, than many of the detached accessory dwelling units that are otherwise permitted by code and by the conservation overlay design guidelines would be. So I would uh, ask your favorable consideration for that appeal for case um, 46, I believe it was. Uh, the other case that I wish to speak to is case number 2018-39, which is for property located at 114 Lindsley Park Drive, also in the Lachlan Springs neighborhood. Um, it's my understanding that the appellant is seeking uh, a request, a variance from the sidewalk requirements and that the variance requested is not to construct sidewalks but also not to contribute to the in lieu fund. I cannot support that. Um, I do recognize that this is kind of a narrow street. There are some topography issues with that site, which the property owner, uh, it, well, they're obvious to see just driving by it. There is quite a slope. Um, for this particular property, there had been uh, a hearing a while back before the Metro Historic Zoning Commission, which uh, took into account the slope uh, on the site as they were reviewing the design of the building uh, at that time. But um, I, uh, 
am willing to support uh, a variance that would enable them to pay the in lieu uh, into the fund, but uh, I'm unwilling to support a variance for both. Um, and I know that there have been a, a few letters from uh, Lachlan Springs residents and others kind of throughout the county who uh, have written uh, with a similar position. Sidewalks are just such a priority uh, for our county that we will, um, if we allow too many variances, we will we will never get them constructed. And, and at some point there's even a fairness issue for property owners. Uh, sometimes when there is an existing sidewalk present, um, uh, a variance makes sense either just to retain it or to do repairs or things like that. That's not the case here, but uh, we, we, we do need to make sure that folks are either constructing sidewalks or uh, paying into the in lieu. So I would not support the appeal uh, to do n neither of those, but I would support a modified appeal just to pay the in lieu fund for that property frontage. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Councilman Withers? Thank you for being here. Thank you so See you much. soon. Councilman Davis. Thank you, board members. Thank you for volunteering your time. Um, thank you, code staff, for um, your hard work and your overtime with no extra pay. And thank you, um, other Metro employees, Metro Legal, Public Works. And thank you for the citizens here that took time out of their busy work day to come out and to support their neighbors or their neighborhood or to speak up for their neighborhood. I really didn't want to be here today. You know, nice day, you know, knocking on doors, but one of the real problems right now is when you're talking to people in the community and I'm going to violate one of my major rules you know, our unspoken rule about councilmatic courtesy. Now, I got permission from Mr. Pridemore, you know, so I'm technically not violating, but I don't like to talk about or, or get in the business of another councilman unless I'm invited. And this time I was invited with open hands because um, the Madison community is dear to my heart also. It's right next door to my community in District 5. Um, it's represented by Great people, you got Nancy Van Reese, Anthony Davis, Pride Moore and Pardue, Course Beck, um, the mighty Brenda Gilmore, a lot of others, you know, out there. And I think Tim Garrett at one time had a little bit of this wonderful place called Madison. And if I've got a few of you, please forgive me. But I do have something in common. About five years ago, my community had to fight off a waste transfer station. Now, I understand we're having a growing trash problem in this city. But all the time, they always look to the poor communities, the ethnically different communities, or the communities that are just rising up. And all of a sudden, we're going to put this right here. Just when Madison is getting all this great play, everybody's talking about Madtown. I knew about Madtown a long time ago. Everybody's talking about Anqui Station. I knew about that a long time ago, too. You know, how great it was out there. Now, all of a sudden, the whole world is looking at Madison. Then all of a sudden, here comes the big bad waste transfer station. Well, I remember that fondly because, you know, a long time ago when people were looking at the other side of Gallatin, about five years ago, this great place, Cleveland Park, McFerrin, and here comes the waste transfer station. If that waste transfer station were in my district, I never would have gotten top golf. You know, we probably would have never gotten the, the baseball stadium, you know, which was right on the other side, you know, in District 19, if this would have been there. We need somewhere to put our trash. We have a big problem. We have a dump that we're using in Rutherford County that's about to be in capacity in two years. But as a community, as a city council, we have to come together and figure out what we're gonna do. More recycling, more other stuff. But I don't wanna put something like that in another neighborhood. And I know our neighbors in South Nashville have had many battles of this too. I mean, I see all the time, sewer stations, waste transfer, let's expand this dump, you know. And I'm here to lend my support um, to my colleagues. Um, Bob Mendez is representing Mr. Pridemore today, um, and, I'm, and I support him as well, and I support my neighbors in there in Madison to do whatever we can to come up with a solution that does not put this in the middle of their neighborhood. And I wanna just thank the board for their understanding, and I am against this, 
And I'm gonna ask Mr. Pridemore to please come and speak to the Minority Caucus in order to get further and stronger council support, because I am the president of the Minority Caucus. So I do invite your neighbors. Um, if I'm, I believe most of my members are with you, and after Mr. Pridemore asks for our help, I think 100% of us will be with you. So I just wanna thank everybody, and I wanna thank the commission for their hard work, and have, have a great day. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Councilman Davis? Thanks. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, previously we had identified one case for the consent agenda. It was removed because of a opposing member of the community. Uh, that member has learned a little more about the case and decided she does not oppose the okay. case. So Which we will ask that? that the board take consideration of case number 2018-048. This is the property at 294B McGavick Pike. Um, this can go back onto the consent agenda as originally recommended and we would solicit a vote from the board at this time. Okay, that has been, I'll move that back to consent agenda. Is there a second? Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of putting case 48 back on the consent agenda say aye. Aye, opposed, passes unanimously. With that, Mr. Chairman, we're ready to begin the uh, hearings for today's BZA meeting. Again, for any who are present for case number 48 involving that property on McGavick, the case is passed. You're welcome to leave. You're welcome to stay. Uh, as you'll recall, Mr. Chairman, we had agreed to put case 63 and 64 at the top of the docket so we could hear from planning staff on those various requests. So as I'm queuing up those, we'll invite the appellant forward. Case number 2018-63, Dewey Engineering is the appellant and all sevens LLC. Please come forward for case 63 now. Who's the owner of the property at 29 09 12th Avenue South. The request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements in the OR20 zoning district in conjunction with the construction of a new yoga studio. Uh, the board, of course, has jurisdiction uh, under 1740-180B, the variance section, and this is um, under 17020-120, the sidewalk section of the zoning code. As the uh, appellant gathers his information, prepares to make his presentation to the board, we will note that this is um, not a request for an outright variance, but instead an alternative sidewalk construction, which of course is slightly different in the board's review. We'll pull up the case file in just one second. Mr. Chairman, the zoning map shown here gives you an indication of the proximity of 12th Avenue South and Kirkwood for this corner lot just across the street from Sevier Park at the end of the 12th South neighborhood before it continues down on uh, southward toward one of the preeminent educational institutions in all the South Lips uh, University. It's going to their first NCAA <laughs> appearance. I knew you couldn't get by without mentioning The aerial photograph gives you some indication of the buildings well in the neighborhood uh, as well as the sidewalk network that is in place along 12th Avenue South. The site plan submitted, and the uh, engineer may have an updated version of this, but this was the originally submitted site plan giving you a layout of the proposed building as well as orientation with regard to the right of way on both Kirkwood and 12 South. From my recent site visit, the view into the interior of the property, not as important, although I've included that in the upper left-hand corner, and then the view down 12 South going away from downtown and toward Lipscomb in the lower right-hand corner, the view across the street, sort of catty corner up and across Kirkwood and 12 South in the upper left, and the view down Kirkwood on the lower right-hand corner, the um, subject property, of course, being to the left of that particular photograph. Uh, Mr. Michael Dewey, as I noted, is the representative for the project. The owners are present as well. Is there opposition present for case number 63? There is. As a result, both sides will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Uh, for Mr. Dewey and the appellants, if you wish to save some portion of this 10 minutes for rebuttal, please do so out of this original 10 minutes. With that, please introduce yourselves by name and address and make the desired presentation. Thank you, John. My name is uh, Michael Dewey with Dewey Engineering. Our address is 2925 Berry Hill Drive, uh, Nashville. Our initial request was for um, uh, sidewalk variants uh, with no and Lou fee. Uh, we worked with planning staff uh, and they asked that we consider no grass strip on Kirkwood Avenue. So. I co we coordinated with the owners and we, they complied with, with that request uh, due to the topo. Uh, when we were denied at uh, planning at codes, which is the first step in coming to uh, this step, to the BZA, 
uh, codes requested that we dedicate enough right of way to provide 30 and a half feet from center line on 12th Avenue. So I guess let me back up just a minute. We are agreeing, we are complying with, with planning staff's request to, to build the sidewalks on Kirkwood with no grass strip. So what we're asking for this afternoon is to um, either A, pay an in lieu fee for the sidewalks along 12th Avenue South or construct an alternative sidewalk along 12th Avenue South. And the reason we would like to construct the alternative along 12th Avenue South is as we dedicate 12 and a half, or dedicate right away per what codes asked us to dedicate to meet the MCSP, that would only provide enough right away to, to install a 12 foot sidewalk behind the existing curb and gutter and not a 12 foot sidewalk and a six foot grass strip. So we, we've complied to, to agree to, to, to dedicate enough right away for 30 and a half feet as codes requested, but not to meet the MCSP, which is an additional six feet. So that's that's and, our request for. And that's, and that's what you've shown on the site plan is what you're actually requesting. Yes, what we show on the site plan is what we would, what we're proposing today to be, to be constructed um, for this site. And John Michael, do we have, do we have to give a variance for the Kirkwood Sidewalk. They've agreed to the planning recommendation, and I think that is slightly different from what the black letter of the law would require. So, yes, you'll still want to okay. note if the board chooses to approve that agreement. Okay. The one other thing that I wanted to add is as we, if we dedicate six more feet of right of way along the front, that pushes the front setback further into the site. And as you'll see on the site plan, as we push the building further back towards the alley, it reduces the number of stalls, potentially losing two parking stalls in a much in an area that's searching for that's in much need of parking. Uh, the owners are here as well. Um, so, any questions that that you guys have for them, or or we can reserve the rest of our time. Okay, just please state your name for the record and uh, your address. Nora Shebaik, and my uh, actual, the address of the property is 29. Your home address. Oh, home address, 16 Cherub Court, Brentwood, Tennessee, 37027. Okay. Dina Shebaik via All Sevens, uh, LLC, 600 12th Avenue South, Nashville, 37203. Okay. Uh, you're saying you want to uh, reserve the rest of your time for rebuttal after the opposition speaks? Yeah, unless there's any further questions. Any questions of the applicant? Okay. Um, so go back and we'll come back up here after the opposition and after planning. So John Michael, we're going to hear from our members of our planning commission, particularly um, Pete Bird. We'll That's right. Mr. Chairman, we're joined by Peter Bird from the planning department who's familiar with this case and has worked on it. So we'll ask Mr. Bird to come forward and address the board with regard to uh, the project in question. Yes. And kind of explain your, uh, sure. your recommendation to us. Right on here. All right, good afternoon, uh, Chairman and Board Members. So to reiterate, we, um, the planning staff is agreement on the variance requested on the Kirkwood frontage. Uh, what they're requesting is an alternative sidewalk that's the five-foot five foot sidewalk section with no grass strip. Due, the, due to the topography, mm -hmm. uh, we, we are in agreement on that one. And so I think the big piece that, that we're still kind of working on what we want to talk about is the 12th Avenue South frontage. And... Um, so I guess to start the... the yeah, John Michael, can you put the picture back up that has... Yep, right there. Yep. So the 30 and a half feet that I believe codes, it sounded like code, codes told to the applicant was the, um, was the from center line cross section that they, that they needed for the MTSP, is the general cross section we require for 12th Avenue South, but this section is actually a constrained street. And so what, what does that, that means, mean, constrained so, street? So what that means is that it requires special attention to kind of see what the sidewalks and the grass strips actually are, uh, what, what, they would be, what would be required based on the, the business district in there. Um, but I still don't understand. Why do you call it, most streets are probably not constrained streets. Why is this a constrained street? 
So this was one that was a determination just that it, as development came in that it would require more special attention as to what those exact widths and cross sections would is be. Is that so. because of location, the businesses is there, the foot traffic? I'm trying to understand what a constrained street is. So it's, it's based on, um, based on the, the fact that it's a business district um, and then other specific, um, like the park on one side, the, the wall that's over there, the historic wall, kind of special issues that, that we want to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. And so our requirements were to have, um, as the applicant mentioned, a 12-foot sidewalk with a 6-foot grass strip, um, which would match the which would match the, exi the existing section on the opposite side of Kirkwood on 12th Avenue South. And so our determination um, on that variance request was um, was a disapproval because there there weren't any topographic issues that would constrain them from building that site from building that cross section, and the only impacts that, that we were able to see in, in speaking with the applicant was impacts to parking, and an impact to their existing setback that may require them to go and get an additional setback variance. Okay. Any question for Mr. Bird? Yeah, I I do. So if they if they build the, the sidewalk section that is required and they don't get dedicate any right of way would part of the sidewalk end up on their property well they would have to they would have to dedicate the right of way um, with any sidewalk with, with the, addition, the additional six feet and what would their compensation for that be um, I'm not sure there may be a question I don't know if John Michael is here I think if you just dedicate it it's zero yeah. They if they voluntarily de dedicate it. Yeah. You're not right. offering to pay them. I We're guess not. what Mr. Harper is saying, yes. Right. So we'll confirm that with John Michael. John Michael, the question came up about dedicating um, to the right of way. And how much are people compensated for that when they do that? It is my understanding in these scenarios they are not compensated for the dedication of the right of way with regard to sidewalk requirements on the projects. Okay. Yep. That's what we wanted to know. Okay. Other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to hear from the opposition now. Please come forward. Identify yourself for the record, your name, your address, and why you're in opposition to this. Please press the button so the red light will come on. And let's get started. All right. Hi, I'm Cynthia J. Hicks. I live at 1702 Ashwood Avenue. I'm the president of Belmont Hillsborough Neighbors Incorporated. I sent to you a letter uh, yesterday, but in case you didn't get it, I'd like to read it to you so that you understand what our position is. In regard to case 2018-063, uh, in regard to 2909 12th Avenue South, the steering committee of Belmont Hillsborough Neighbors Inc. voted and is asking that you enforce the existing sidewalk ordinances and require that the owners of 2909 12th Avenue South build the sidewalks per the recommendation of Metro Planning Department. We are in agreement that the sidewalk on Kirkwood should be built next to 2909 12th Avenue South as recommended. It should connect to future completed sidewalks on Kirkwood per the sidewalk ordinance which requires redevelopment projects to contribute to sidewalk construction. We also agree that the sidewalk should be increased in size on 12th Avenue South per the planning department's recommendation and to be in line with the sidewalks north of this property fitting in with the 12th South UDO. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you. Next. My name is Joe. My name is Joe Woolley. I live at 2006 18th Avenue South. I'm the transit committee chair for Belmont Hillsborough Neighbors. I echo everything that our president just said. Um, our steering committee just voted on that. But as transit committee chair, I can tell you that Kirkwood is our top priority street within the neighborhood. Um, it is not a complete street in any way. We have a, the highest walkability score in the city, uh, our, our neighborhood does. But Kirkwood would be our lowest walkable street. Uh, that is because it's been developed really in the last 10 years and it has multiple different setbacks. Uh, the sidewalk on Kirkwood, I disagree with planning. I wish they would have uh, wanted the grass strip because eventually that will line up. We lobbied hard to have Kirkwood put on the walk and bike plan and it is our only priority street, meaning a street, a new street that gets sidewalks in our district. Um, I wish that 
the new sidewalks that will be built would line up to a grass strip and sidewalk on Kirkwood. In regards to 12th, uh, the farmer's market in Severe Park, the Severe Park Festival, and just the heavy uh, walkable nature of 12th South Business District, district um, that 12 foot side, sidewalk is needed uh, as the business district continues down. This corner is also uh, the main way you get to Severe Park from the uh, Belmont side of 12 South. As you can tell by the pictures, there is no sidewalk on the Severe Park side. You have only two access points. You can barely see it in that picture. There's a stairway and a crosswalk further down, and then this intersection. Um, it is important that uh, the pedestrians uh, obviously have access to this crossing point on 12 South. How many people go to Severe Park on any given week, do you know? Uh, Lots. Lots. I mean, <laughs> what are we talking, yeah. hundreds, thousands? Yes. Thousands. What are we? Depending yeah. on the, the weather, yeah, the spring, it will be packed this last weekend. And um, how, do, how do they get there? Well, the farmer's market this year is having to pay an exorbitant amount of money for to Metro. You can see at the end of this picture on the south, south side of the park for traffic crossing because there are no crosswalks there. Um, Councilman Sledge and Councilman Allen are working uh, with the two neighborhood associations for better crossing access on 12th. We're looking at a roundabout at Gale and uh, Granny White. So you're seeing a lot of people walk. Yes. It's so a very walkable area. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Next. Hello, my name is Michael Poole. I live at 1206 Cedar Lane. My property backs up to this across the alley. Um, uh, I'm, I commend the decision to certainly go ahead with the construction of the sidewalk on Kirkwood. To me, that was the most vital aspect of this because it is a very narrow street. It is a highly uh, used pedestrian street as well. Um, so I'm really happy to hear that they're going forward with that. I would agree with uh, what that it would be better were it to be built to the actual spec um, for that because the uh, the uh, the street is busy. I, I, I forgot to mention I've lived at that address for the past 16 years. Both my any questions? Okay, just briefly, if the sidewalk fund had existed 10 years ago, 80% of Kirkwood on the north side would be built out with sidewalks, meaning that a uh, new developer, a new house being built has to build a sidewalk. We would have an almost uh, complete street. Um, that I think is why paying into the sidewalk fund or building the sidewalks to code is so important, why that law was written. Okay, thanks. Let's hear from the applicant again. Please come forward. We'll have about... This is rebuttal time, so you're here to respond to what was just said. I'm Michael Dewey again. Uh, we worked. Uh, we work with planning staff, as 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 Mr. Bird mentioned, uh, quite a bit. And we, in fact, we we're trying to get to the consent agenda just to get this case off of your docket for today. But unfortunately, we weren't able to get to that. Uh, well, speaking of that, how come you can't build a sidewalk? It's across from the park. We've just heard testimony. It's a very residential, very walkable neighborhood. What's wrong with building it as planning says they want it built? Uh, because of the right-of-way, uh, the additional right-of-way dedication that's required versus uh, what's uh, supposed to be done. Or codes requested 30 and a half feet from the center line, and that's what we're providing. And so we're providing a 12-foot sidewalk. We're just not providing. Well, the six-foot grass, grass strip is part of what they're requesting, so you're not providing what they requested, are you? We're not providing it per the MCSP, but there's not enough right-of-way in that 30 and a half feet that they've requested to 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 include that section of 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 grass strip and, and sidewalk what what ultimately are you proposing to build exactly within your right of, within the right of way um five foot sidewalk along kirkwood not on kirkwood it, just it, on 12th a 12 foot wide sidewalk no grass strip zero grass strip right because that's the only that's that's we, we went from existing edge of um, back of curb to the dedicated right away that, that we've complied to to dedicate increase the, the entire uh, width as a 12 foot sidewalk um, one other question you had a question earlier about 
why is this a constrained right away and this this is a constrained right away special issue is on street handicapped parking spaces exist north of the intersection of montrose and 12th there's an existing dedication of right away in this area in excess of 61 feet adequate pedestrian facilities would be required if that right away dedication is abandoned so that is that is not you know it, it's because we're on 12th that it's a constrained right of way. But the situation, you know, as, as Mr. Bird pointed out, there's special situations that make it a constrained street situation. Um, so, and and that's, the, that's, the, that's the special issue on this one. Any questions for the applicant? I have a question. Oh, I'm, let's see if it's, oh I'm sorry, I thought I had. Okay, sorry, I was punching the wrong button. I have a concern because I heard you talk about uh, needing that space for parking. We haven't heard anything about eminent domain. We've been hearing that you've been asked to, to donate land and that then leaves you short of parking space. Would you please address that? Yes, ma'am. So we are dedicating two and a half feet in the current plan that you have. That's 12 foot grass strip, no, or 12 foot sidewalk, no grass strip. If we um, provide the six foot grass strip, then that pushes the entire building further back into to the, towards the alley in the rear, which would then uh, push, it pushes the building back, which constrains the parking in the rear and results in a loss of two parking stalls, uh, which is in an area that's, yeah, I'm, I'm parking is, that area. is needed. Anything else to add? May I? Yes, of course. Uh, so where the property is, 2909, uh, currently shares a driveway and there's a mutual easement between, uh, I believe it's 2911, it's Las Palitas. Um, the proposed plan as we have it now would eliminate that easement which it's our understanding just by talking to those owners, that that would be something that they would like, which would now make our ingress and our egress from the alleyway. If the building is pushed back even further, in addition to losing the parking stalls in the back, um, if the building is pushed back because we will be required to have an additional six feet grass strip, that could put a burden on the alleyway where now from Kirkwood entering the property ingress and egress will not be on the 12th side any longer in between the two buildings as you see it. So you're saying you have a private agreement with the owners of the neighboring property and if you were to do this as proposed that easement goes away? Correct. That doesn't have anything to do with us. Okay. You know, it's just, you know, so would the Los Palatas people still maintain the driveway or they would go to the alley too? I'm not sure, but I guess what I'm what I'm saying, the reason why I said that is because if, if the grass strip pushes the building back, I would think that you all would be concerned about the movement on the alleyway from entering into our property since cars can no longer enter the property from the 12th South side. So this just comes down to parking. You're just concerned about two parking spaces, am I correct? Not just parking, but the ease with which people can, you know, our neighbor that just spoke that's directly behind who I'm sure has access to that alleyway and people who are traveling down Kirkwood to get into. But as we said, that, I mean, that was an agreement between the two parties. So you can negotiate something with the owners of the, the building of Las Palatas to keep some sort of shared easement, but they apparently had some lawyer way back when that said if you do anything to this building, that shared easement goes away. Is that correct? That's not my understanding of what the agreement is. Oh, so then why, why does the shared easement go away if you do this then? It's my understanding that either Codes or Metro, I'm not sure who the proper, proper entity is, did not want that entrance any longer. That that okay. was their... Well, maybe it was grandfathered in or something, I don't know. Perhaps. So, 
two parking spaces and just that you're concerned about the alley traffic. That's your main point here. Yes. Well, it, it removes, I think um, what uh, Dina's point is, is that it removes uh, access for cars going in and out from pedestrian traffic. So it's, it should create a safer environment if there's no traffic pulling in and out of between these two buildings. Okay. Any other questions? Do you have anything else to add? No, sir. Okay. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. Oh, no. Uh, everything's on the record. We are a public hearing. This is on Metro Nashville Network, so please, every word that's said at this table and that table, please record. Thank you. Okay. Discussion. I want to hear what Mr. Taylor says about the Harper. Harper. They, they switched me around. Yes, I, exactly. Got the beard. Well, I, you know, I'm I'm uncomfortable without with asking them to uh, donate a right of way. Uh, I mean, if they want to volunteer it, that's fine. But I'm I'm not really interested in making that a condition upon approval and I think I think it's you know it seems like it's a pretty good compromise and I it seems like planning is, is okay with it uh, and again you know if if they were willing to dedicate the right away then I would expect them to ask for a variance on the setback which I would feel like that we would be inclined to to give but that would still affect their parking. No, well, I'm saying if one of the reasons, as is, is I'm hearing this, uh, is that if they dedicate the right of way, then that right of way moves back. Therefore, their setback moves back. That's why they have to move the building. So I would think that if they were going to dedicate the right of way, they would then be asking for a variance so they wouldn't have to move their building back. They're not asking, so maybe that's just hypothetical so but what's in front of us now I you know I, I think I'm, I'm willing to support what's in front of us now and I, I I'm not willing to ask anybody to to donate their their property without compensation I think it amounts to a taking I tend to agree with mr. Harper you know we had testimony today from the opposition and this is a very busy street and a busy corner of a busy street next to a old park um, I think the wider sidewalks and the grass strip which is for safety is important in this neighborhood now the right-of-way thing that's a another issue but I think that's we have a new sidewalk law and this is what the new sidewalk law requires but see I think it's never a good idea to argue with a lawyer about the law, but <laughs> so, no, I mean, so everybody me. has a, everyone has a voice here. I, I, I think I, I don't know that it's illegal, but it, it doesn't seem proper to force or to require someone to build to a standard that cannot be met. I mean, it physically cannot be met without the dedication of the right of way. So. If the government is going, I never get to be the libertarian on this committee, so if the government is going to require a particular sidewalk section that requires them to uh, give up their property, then I think the government should have to compensate those people. Again, if it's voluntary, that's, that's great, but since it is physically impossible, the road can't move property land, the only thing that can move here is the property line or the, the easement or the, the right of way, sorry. So I, I therefore think that in good conscience, we can only grant the variance. And I think that they've made, I think they've made a good faith effort to work with the city to, to find a compromise. I mean, clearly the city isn't willing to, to pay them for the property or they would have offered. Well, I want to know if I'm missing something. I, th I thought we were saying there was a 12-foot sidewalk. That is a large, very wide sidewalk. And is that provide, right? Yeah, they are providing that. But not the six-foot grass strip. But not the grass strip. Because there, there isn't physical, there physically isn't room to do both. 
John Michael, why is the sidewalk bill written that way, and what's the kind of why is it triggered? And his David Wright that basically there's no way to build this sidewalk without voluntarily giving uh, into the right of way to the to the city. Do I understand the chairman's question to be why did council write the bill the way no. they wrote it? <laughs> why, why? I'll decline to answer that question, Mr. Chairman. In this case, can they build a sidewalk that's 12 feet wide and a six foot grass strip uh, without giving property into the right of way? It has to go into the right of way. I mean, you see where the property lines are now, you see where the right of way exists now, the center line of the street, you see what's required. Um, I think Mr. Harper probably accurately described the factual circumstances with regard to the availability of land, absent a scenario where you get into uh, the interior of the property. And so the applicant under these situations even asking if they were to do it that way, they'd have to voluntarily give this land to the city? Is that what we're hearing? I won't quibble on semantics at all. I mean, what we see in a lot of this case and other cases are in order to develop the property in the way that a property owner wishes to develop it, there are certain requirements under our bulk regulations. Included with that is not only the bulk regulations under 1712, but the sidewalk requirements. This is merely part of that which is required to develop the property in the way it's sought here. So, yes, they do have the option of just not developing it and thus not having to do the sidewalk. Even or leaving the, the building in the current state, then obviously they wouldn't have to build a new sidewalk and a new Leaving the project. Happen. We remind people all the time, nobody's required to build a sidewalk. Only if you want to get the building permit and construct the building you want to build, do you potentially trigger the sidewalk requirements. And that may sound obvious, but people conveniently forget that in a lot of the analysis of these cases. So if you want to pursue this, and the law explicitly requires this type of sidewalk construction, those are the numbers, six, on the, uh, six feet on the planter strip, 12 on the sidewalk itself, lining up with the next block over on 12 South. However, the, um, the appellants in this case and the appellants in every case are allowed to bring these appeals to the board. You do have the authority to hear them to determine if that's the right variance. Okay, board members, that's what's in front of us. I have to weigh in and say I'm very familiar with that area. Uh, and in listening to the applicants and the opposition, as well as planning, if we, let's just consider, if we grant this variance and there's no grass strip, the purpose for which is to provide safety and a buffer between the street and the location, I think we're setting a precedent in that community. We've heard evidence that that's a highly walkable community. I know that to be true. You guys know that to be true. And not only is it walkable by adults, but Severe Park has two playgrounds in it that are frequented by small children and their parents. And this is the intersection. This is where they walk. This is where they go get a popsicle. Uh, this is where they go frequent all of the merchants that are in the 12 South area. I feel strongly that the grass strip should be required. I also consider that we won't be able to get a sidewalk across the street. So this is going to be the only location in which you can have a lot of pedestrian traffic. So I am. Okay. So it's motion time. <laughs> Divided board, four votes. So someone might as well just get us started. Anyone? Well, I would say it would affect my opinion if I could ask planning another question. Okay. Mr. Bird, please come forward. Let him sit at the microphone. Press the button and question. So am I accurately saying that the reason for that grass buffer is a safety concern? It is. Um, on 12 South specifically, if you see on the other side of Kirkwood, there are examples where instead of having just the pure six foot grass strip, there's parking there, which would be a combination of that six feet plus the gutter pan, typically about eight feet. And so the applicant does have the option um, through the MCSP, through these design standards, to instead of having a six foot grass strip, to have parking that would be on 12th Avenue South on street. Kind of similar to what some of the other parking kind of a yeah, pull in the parallel of, space. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. On the other side of Kirk, what you've seen that they've they've shown that would provide a parking. buffer for safety once again to the pedestrians. Exactly. And so, are you agree? Is planning agreeable? Your position would be the. 
12 foot sidewalk is not sufficient without a grass buffer. Correct. But planning is not willing to say the sidewalk could be a little smaller and we could have a smaller buffer. We're, there's just no middle ground there. Um, I, I think our position on that is that we didn't, we haven't seen any, any constraints that were strong enough to, I guess, to convince us to, to do an alternative sidewalk. Okay. But there were no topographic issues. All right. Okay. Anything else? Okay. We're going to close the public hearing again. Discussion? Motion. Let's have a motion, someone. I'm going to make a motion that we uh, don't grant the variance for the reasons that I stated. Okay. And I will second that. Motion's been made properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying hand, aye with hands. Aye. aye. Against? Okay. Should we, we'll go through the next motion. Well, so, so what happens if we don't have a motion? Uh, we'll ask our lawyer. What happens if we had two, we had two people for, two people against? What if we have no other motion? Well, if you, well, this motion would fail, and yep. so um, I believe it's the case would stay open, stay open until the next meeting for the other board members to review okay. the case and make a motion and vote. So we'll do we, that. We don't have to rehear it. Uh, you do not have to rehear no, it. They they'll get to review, review this, it. They'll watch it on the Metro Nashville Network and Correct. then hopefully come back with a vote. So. Correct. The parties are free in the meantime to otherwise yeah. continue their oh, the, Yeah, the parties are free to talk to planning and come up with something. So, John Michael. The case will be on the next docket, April the 5th, 2018. The next case to be presented to the board is 2018-064, Dewey Engineering, the appellant on behalf of EBO Properties, General Partnership, the owner of the property, located at 3813 Elkins Avenue, shown here on the zoning map. The request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements in the RS5 zoning district for construction of single family residence. Although this aerial is dated in that the uh, structure identified is now demolished, it does give you an accurate representation of the intersection in question there on Elkins. The site plan submitted gives a proposed layout for the construction and orientation of the sidewalk in that area. From my recent site visit, a view of the subject property on one of our sunnier days immediately after the snow. The view uh, down Elkins inbound toward downtown there is seen in the lower right hand corner. The upper left shows you the westbound uh, view on Elkins. The view um, to the due south there in the lower right hand corner and the view back up toward Charlotte Pike in the upper left hand corner. Mr. Dewey is the uh, representative from Dewey Engineering who's representing the case along with his clients. Gentlemen, please introduce yourself by name and address. Before doing so, let me confirm, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 64? Please raise your hand if so. There is not. As a result, you have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Gentlemen. Blake Owen, 2908 Snowden Road, Nashville. Blake Owen. Andrew Edwards. 2908 Snowden Road, Nashville. Uh, Eric Owen, 5371 Alvin Sperry, Mount Juliet. Okay. I'm Michael Dewey with Dewey Engineering, 2925 Berry Hill Drive in Nashville. Okay. That's what you call a BZA sound check for our court reporter, so proceed. Um, this project is located at the corner of Elkins and 39th Avenue North. Uh, this is another lot, single family house that's on a corner lot. Uh, the initial request was to leave the existing sidewalks on um, uh, Elkins and not, and not pay the in lieu fee for 39th Avenue uh, due to the uh, hardship of the topo on 39th Avenue. Uh, as we worked through the process, staff asked us to uh, investigate removing the grass strip on 39th Avenue. So we mentioned that we would investigate that. So we did. And, uh, and as we studied that, there is about 10 acres of drainage coming uh, north of this site to the uh, triple catch basin that was installed at the corner of Elkins and 39th. 
So are you saying that basically that prevents you from building a sidewalk? I'm saying that it becomes a, a burden on a single family house for to install the the stormwater infrastructure required for a to, sidewalk. For for okay. the sidewalk. So why don't you pay into the in lieu fund? So we would be willing to pay a, a, a reduced rate into the in lieu fee. Why reduced rate? Uh, well, the it, for a single family home, it's it's, it's this extraordinary burden in that we have two two hundred linear feet of road frontage. Um, now we have some Metro Council people here. Still, they voted for this. This passed unanimously. I would think that they knew what they were voting on. And you know, this we have a sidewalk bill, yeah. and so it says either build the sidewalks, and we understand the whole thing with stormwater and other things, or pay into the in lieu fund. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, we bought this in May before the sidewalk went into effect, so we didn't have that option in our negotiation with the sale of the or with the purchase of the lot, um, which again, bad luck, but. Um, are so part of the reason that, you know, in most of these cases it's 50 feet of frontage, which we'll pay the re the reduced part. We understand that. Um, so you're going to tear down this house, is what you're saying? Yeah, we already have torn it down. Yes, okay. Sir. So, yes, so you yeah. know, when you bought this, you were going to tear it down, and so when you tear it down, that's what you guess you have to build new sidewalks now. So right. that's kind of where we are. Right. And you're are you living at this house, or are you going to sell it? No, we will sell it. So you pass along the extra costs of the sidewalk to <coughs> future Nashville residents, right? Assuming it works that way, yes, sir. So but tell us why you're here to convince this board why we should let you out of the duly unanimously passed sidewalk bill or paying into the in-lieu fund. Um, well, we're, we, we support the sidewalk bill. We understand that. This, this case, the um, sidewalk is even more of a burden due to the stormwater and the topo of the lot. But in terms of paying into the lieu of fee, it's, it's a little unique in the lot in that it's 200 linear feet of street frontage, which is also goes back into it being cost prohibitive for a single family home. I know finance, financial matters aren't necessarily a burden, but in this case, it's more the length of the sidewalk and that is multiplied by, you know, the in lieu of fee is per linear feet, where in most cases in these residential inches is 50 feet. Uh, in this case, we have that times four. Anything else to add? Questions of the applicant? No? Okay. Well, I'm sorry, I do. So uh, this wa uh, the, the water is coming from up the hill, which is toward the back of the park. <coughs> The alley direction is, is that right? Yes, it's coming from the alley towards Elkins. So, so right now the there's no curb there at all. That's correct. So, if if you don't do the sidewalk, you literally do nothing to the grade, correct? For this water. Correct. Correct. Okay. In what? Yes. Sir. Uh, one other thing that I can add is, uh, as we were working with staff, and staff was extremely patient and very helpful uh, with us on this project, uh, as we had a, uh, quite a few questions with uh, for them. Uh, but one thing that you know, they were working hard to get us on the consent agenda, which we would love to have gotten on. But there was uh, one thing that we couldn't uh, come to an agreement on, and that is, we. Because the sidewalk turns the corner on Elkins onto 39th Avenue North, that becomes the block face for, uh, the sidewalks are now on the block face of 39th, which is uh, the in lieu fee applicability is no longer available to pay the in lieu fee right. for 39th. Well, that's why I asked if you'd be willing to pay the in lieu fee oh, when I, we started. I, and, and so we would, yes. So, yes. So, so the reduced port. What we're asking for today is the reduced portion, meaning the planning's not going along with that. Well, well they they along 39th, along 39th instead yes. of the entire front, because yes. staff is 
tactics. Yes, ma'am. And it's because staff is, is in agreement with the portion of sidewalk that's on 39th. So on 39th, they've even allowed you to do a five foot sidewalk without a grass strip, which is a compromise for planning, right? Um, yes. Okay. It, it, are, are we, I, I, we might be misunderstanding. You, you look confused. I just want to make sure that we're understanding this correctly. They want to build, it sounds like, the five foot sidewalk without the grass strip and then pay into the in-lieu fee on the front. No, sir. We, we want to we wanna leave, we want 30, uh, staff said 30, uh, Elkins sidewalk was good. What we would like to do is pay the in-lieu up fee for the portion along 39th because of the stormwater burden, the okay. stormwater infrastructure that we need to put in. But not the, but you don't want to pay in the Elkins. Correct. But because would you build a sidewalk on Elkins? There's, there's one there. There's one there. Oh, there's one. Okay. Yeah. You'd right. leave that there. So, you're, so on this drawing that you provided, it's the highlighted area is the length that you would be paying the in lieu fee. Yes. Correct. Okay. Which is how many feet? And so that property um, is 145 feet. Okay. Anything else to add? Okay. We're going to close the public hearing. Discussion. I was a little confused at first. Now I, I understand it. So we have the recommendation of planning, and we also just understood what they're proposing. So, so uh, unless there's more discussion, I'm willing to to move that we. Uh, and forgive the interruption, uh, Mr. Harper. We are joined once again by Peter Bird, who's worked on this case specifically at the planning oh, staff, and I knew that the board was interested in hearing from him on yeah, that matter. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry about that, and let's hear about um, why, what you, your recommendation. So why did you, um, yeah, no, tell us about your recommendation. Yeah, yeah, so, so we're, agreement, we're in agreement on the variance request for Elkins Avenue. It's a local street, there's an existing sidewalk, it matches the network in the neighborhood, and so we are in agreement on that one, not upgrading the sidewalk and not needing to pay into the in-lieu fund. Uh, the question specifically is on 39th, like the applicant mentioned, they're in, by the, as the law is written, they're ineligible to pay into the in-lieu fund because there's an existing sidewalk as you round the corner. Mm -hmm. And so our recommendation originally to them, which is supported by Metro Public Works, uh, just for a constructability standpoint, is building that five foot sidewalk with no grass strip. And um, I guess in their application specifically, they only cited topographic issues. And so if they have any more questions about stormwater drainage, that's something that we're willing to work with work with Metro Water Services, but that's not something that we've explored right now, so we'd request a deferral to be able to do that if they want to go that route. So you're saying for uh, 39th, you just want them to uh, build the sidewalk with the with no grass strip? That would be our preference. What about the in-lieu, what's your take on having just them pay into the in -lieu fund for that section? Um, we, we took it from the perspective that I, th I think our ideal would be them building the sidewalk, of but we wanted to leave that option to the, to the board to be able to make that determination if you see fit. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Bird? Okay. Uh, no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yes. We're going to bring back the applicant. Okay. Or at least the engineer. We'll have the whole. Those architects like those engineers. Okay. So, so, so my question is, I, I'm getting the sense that there's, there's more to the, the stormwater mitigation than just building the sidewalk and the curb. Is there, is there more infrastructure that has to be added? Yes, if we build sidewalks with curb and gutter, then uh, storm, stormwater infrastructure, a, a pipe and a catch basin will need to be installed. Right. along that's, that stretch. So I don't and know if that was obvious. I, I was just picking up on that on the drawing that says right now there is no catch basin mm -hmm. at, at the uh, alley. At the alley, correct. So you would have to be, you would have to add a catch basin and a new water or a sewer line all the way down to the existing catch basin. Yes. If, that's if they were to yes. build a sidewalk on if, 30. If they build a sidewalk, they have to build all of that. And, yep. so. and, and procedurally, the only reason we could not get to consent is because of where it turns the corner, it becomes block face, so we can't pay appli applicability fee. And so therefore, if, I mean, what we were trying to do is we were either pay the in lieu fee or we build a sidewalk. We'd love to have the option of either one if you guys would grant us the option of either us build it or we're able to pay the in lieu fee. But if you build it, you have to deal with all the stormwater things, right? Right, correct. But or we can pay the in lieu fee. Okay. 
Any other questions? Okay, thank you. I'm gonna close the public hearing again. Mr. Harper. Uh, well, how, how do you guys feel about the ban? I'm comfortable with the ban. The alert being on. Well, let's, let's have a motion. All right. So I move that we, uh, well, and to clarify, we, we're still granting a variance for Elkins. For Elkins. So that okay. should be in your motion. So, okay. So uh, I move that we grant the variance uh, uh, providing that uh, the sidewalk on Elkins remains and that the applicant uh, be allowed to pay the in lieu fee for the uh, 39th Avenue frontage as indicated on the uh, submitted plans. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Well, I would just say to uh, Mr. Harper that planning did ask that they dedicate right of way for future sidewalk construction. I know your opinion on that, but do you want to include that in your motion? Or maybe I don't know your opinion. Uh, I, I wasn't, I didn't, I'm not, did we have testimony on that from the applicant? Can we ask them? Sure. Uh, did, are you willing to dedicate the right of way? For a future sidewalk. For a future sidewalk. What is the dedicated sidewalk? What is the It's in planning's recommendation that you dedicate. But do we, he's asking, I think, how much. Oh, I'm sorry. Does he know how much? I don't know the answer. Well, we don't. Since we don't have it. Okay. Back to your motion. Okay. Motion has uh, been made. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not going to amend the motion. Okay. 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 So any Actually, I won't second that. I think they should dedicate the right of way. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> motion has been unseconded. I will second it. We have a motion properly seconded now. So, discussion. Um, any, okay, those are in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye and hands up to uh, aye. aye. Opposed. Only the red okay. Passes four to one. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, with one moment, we'll pull up the next case, which is 2017-417. Grant Maxwell is the appellant and owner of the property at 1610 Forest Avenue. This is an item A appeal involving a short-term rental permit. The uh, the applicant uh, operated prior to ob obtaining the legally required permit, hence the appeal. Please come forward if you would, Mr. Maxwell, so you can make your presentation to the board very well. I'll pull up the quick slides for you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the property on Forest Avenue shown there on the zoning map and here in the aerial photograph gives you some indication of the residential neighbor, uh, nature of the neighborhood from the assessor's website, a face photograph as well. Uh, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 2017-417 involving the property at 1610 Forest Avenue? Seeing no one, the appellants will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Just introduce yourself by name and address. Okay. I'm Grant Maxwell at 1610 Forest Avenue. Uh, Nashville, Tennessee, 37206. Um, I have a timeline if, uh, if you'd like to see it. Okay. Give that to us. Okay, so please tell us why you're here and why you didn't con <laughs> conform to the short-term rental law. Uh, so we bought the house in May of 2017 um, with the intention of, of uh, finishing out uh, an apartment over the garage, um, which we did. And uh, let me see, we listed the apartment over the garage on Airbnb um, while we were preparing the application um, on about uh, September 20th. And it, it, was just a, it was just a really big mistake. We didn't do, uh, we, we, we understood that, that um, there were unlimited owner-occupied um, permits, and so we just didn't do enough research, and we really, really regret having done that. Um, it was just a, a huge, huge mistake. Um, and so we had our first guest. I, I'm not sure exactly when I... I um, just to make it more yeah. clear, it sounds like you rented it on 922, mm -hmm. and then you realize, oh, Metro has laws related to this, and then you filled out your application. Oh, you knew... Well, oh, you were working. Okay. We, we we knew that they required a permit. We just didn't know. We just didn't know that it was 
honestly that this was it was this big of a deal. That Metro meant it. Yeah, we just we just didn't really do our research. Um, okay, and they do, and so I, that's why you're here. Yeah. So when you found, well, you knew, and then you had your first guest. So how many guests did you have? We we had quite a few. And what's quite a few? I think. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, it was maybe every weekend. Every every weekend. It was maybe like I I, I don't know. I, I I was maybe nineteen. How about nine? Yeah. Eighteen. Eighteen sounds about yeah. right. Um, and so so we you know during this time I was already getting my application ready. It, it turned out to be much more extensive than I had imagined it would be, which was my mistake, and I, I deeply deeply regret mm -hmm. that. Um, and. <laughs> Uh, so I, I went in for the permit, and um, I had almost everything I needed except for the two. Uh, we needed two additional letters for the people right across from us and behind us. And and there's a nice little checklist when you do this online. So you didn't see that part of it. Well, they, they actually don't don't specify which neighbors you need. It. There's no information about which neighbors you need it from. Well, how about just sending it to anybody near your house? So you didn't do that. No, I sent it to to the ones on either side. Okay. Um, and and I try. I tried to find the information and and I didn't. So so I went in and he told me that um, we needed the ones in front and behind and then and that we also had to get the covenant changed. So I went to the the, the relevant office and got the covenant changed. Um, and and then uh, then we received um, a letter, um, the cease and desist letter, um, which said we needed to resolve the situation by December fifteenth. And so you canceled future bookings after that. We did. We went. How many? We went. Um, we well. We went in the next day to talk to Codes over at the adjacent building, and he told us to cancel all, all relevant bookings. And I think we canceled relevant. Most, what do you mean? All bookings. Okay. Yeah. All future bookings. Yes. Uh, and and I think uh, we canceled like six or seven. Okay. Uh, that I'm not exactly sure yep. about that. Okay. Number. Questions. Do you have anything else to add? Uh, we're, we're really, we're really sorry that that we uh, didn't so follow you, the, this the is a case that you know you knew that we had a law, mm -hmm. and then you just started to rent, and then just hope that Metro wouldn't find out we're busy and it's city, and a lot of people want to visit. How'd you end up here? It was, it was. I'm sorry. What? How'd you end up? It, it was, it was more, it was more a, a lack of research, honestly. Uh, so. So we, we just didn't we just didn't. Um, but your timeline into. says listed apartment over garage while preparing application on about 9 2017. Mm -hmm. So you were preparing the application, mm -hmm. and you had your first guest 9 22. Yes. And then you say realize the application was more extensive than per expected, procrastinated, regrets yeah. this very much. Yes, that's right. Okay, so anything else to add? I mean, I, 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 I uh, bow to your, uh, your authority, sir. Okay, well, it's the, the laws of Metro. Okay, thank you. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. Is there any opposition? No. Oh, Mr. McBroom, tell us about this case. This is our enforcer. You'll see a lot of him today. Uh, tell us how you heard about this. Any other non-permitted violations? Um, Mr. Chairman, this came to us through a uh, hotline tip submission, um, and it was reported, and I'll just read it to you, unpermitted short-term rental, there's an unpermitted accessory dwelling in the back uh, backyard of 1610 Forest Avenue. Uh, this was not pictured on the property assessor's um, uh, uh, property card, and so uh, it required a site visit to confirm uh, the uh, picture of the exterior of the uh, structure was pictured in the advertisement that was uh, on Airbnb. Uh, upon making a site visit, it was confirmed that it was the, indeed the, uh, the structure, and it's referred to as a DADU, it's the detached accessory dwelling unit. Um, it is, uh, unfortunately, there is a covenant that was in the permit that was uh, issued at the time that the um, uh, unit was built, which would prohibit it being used as a dwelling unit, and also it could not be used for commercial uses. So, John Michael. Can I, can I? That, well, we're going to hear from John Michael first. Covenant about this dadu. 
Yeah, I'll entertain any specific question you may have. I don't have a ton of general information on this. Obviously, where there is. to enforce this? So, uh, detached accessory dwelling unit, frequently referred to by its acronym, DADU, is actually a part of the zoning code, allowed in only certain areas, um, often that we find them in historically protected districts, parts of East Nashville included. Um, but you do have to have a permit for that. So it doesn't matter that the structure itself might meet the qualifications. You do, in fact, have to have a permit to use such a detached structure as a dwelling unit because there are certain safety checks that have to be conducted to make sure uh, that the structure is in fact eligible. So we do have instances in Nashville where people have properly permitted DADU units that are used for short-term rental properties that is potentially allowable. Uh, operating without a permit is not a way to get to allowable status and operating with a non-permitted structure is not a way to get to that status. So it's a normal part of the zoning code. There are circumstances where you can have that. Sounds like they didn't quite get there on this one. Okay, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Yes. Many times when you have detached garages that are constructed and they have a space above where you park your car, um, we will require the covenant that that cannot be converted into living space. We that may, may be the case here. I don't know. We Metro, yes. when, when you construct a detached garage so and you have a space over it, it, it cannot be used as a dwelling unit. So we require a covenant that says that the property owner agrees that's what it will was never done be. Way back when. Probably so. So, so, so Metro is party to the covenant. So what, what authority do we have in enforcing? Normally when we deal with covenants, we're dealing with uh, homeowners associations or? Well, this is just not our deal right now, but but we'll, we'll, there'll be a time and a place to get to it. What did you have to add? Um, when, I, when I went to apply for the permit. Did you um, build the structure first of all? No, no okay. we didn't. So um, when you went to apply for the permit, what? Um, they, the, the, the person at Codes mm -hmm. um, told me that I needed to go to um, the, the, I don't remember the name of the office, but it's, it's in the, the Predator Stadium where you can get the covenant changed or, put in, or get a new covenant put down. And I went through a whole process of um, filling, out, filling out forms and getting it notarized. Um, so we did, in fact, get the covenant changed on, that, on the property. Okay, Mr. McBroom, anything else to add on this? Um, just that on the uh, 28th of November, a stop work order was posted um, and the appeal was filed on December the 6th. The ad uh, came down on December the 12th at the reinspection and has uh, remained down and has had no rental activity that was confirmed in the interim. Okay, thank you. Anything else to add? Okay, we're going to close the public hearing discussion. So we're here to talk about the violation of the short-term rental law. There is a of opposition. Yes, uh, so, you know, here's a case, and we've had a few of these that, you know, hey, have this house, start an application, just didn't finish it, or something was missing, rented it anyway on a short-term rental, and then we have this staff and host compliance and everything else, and they'll eventually find out. So, now once they did get caught, they cancel all future bookings, so. If David Taylor were here, he would probably say this falls in the four to six. Is there a motion? I would make a motion we find the zoning administrator did not err and the applicant should be allowed to apply for uh, his permit four months from the date he filed his appeal, which I believe was December 5th. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? My discussion is I think it should be higher. <laughs> I would be more comfortable with six. I'll amend my motion. Uh, and you're right, Mr. Taylor, I probably should have said that because they did operate knowing that they needed a permit. So I will amend my motion to say they could apply six months from December 5th. And I'll actually renew my second this time. Okay. Motion's been made and renewed a second. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Mm -hmm. Passes. You'll be eligible six months from the date of your stop work letter. Yes. 
December 5th. No, the date they filed. They filed. Appeal. So six months after that, you can apply again. John Michael. Am I allowed to say one thing? What? The case is over. The case is closed. Next case to be heard by the board is 2018-020. Gary Wisniewski is the appellant. And uh, of the subject property at 1001 Summit Avenue. The request is for a variance from the sidewalk requirements here in Council District Number 17 in conjunction with the construction of single family residences. The aerial photograph here gives a orientation for the layout of the subject property to bend in the road. The site plan submitted gives an outstanding uh, depiction of the existing grass strip, the existing curb, and the other elements of the sidewalk and proposed sidewalk. From my recent site visit, the view across the street in the upper left hand corner, the view of the subject property in the lower right. And as this is actually the same street just curved, we've tried to give the best representation of the existing sidewalk network with this slide. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 20? Seeing no one, uh, the appellant will have the opportunity to make a five minute presentation to the board. Just introduce yourself by name and address. Uh, Chairman Ewing and board, thank you for, uh, for hearing me. My name is Gary Wisniewski, the owner of Landmark Homes, 6064 Central Pike, Mount Juliet, Tennessee. The reason for, the, for requesting this variance is due to public safety. On this corner and on Summit Street and also 10th Avenue, there is an existing four foot sidewalk. There is also an existing two foot grass strip that provides for public safety. There are sidewalks on both the north and south side of the street, so we thoroughly embrace the sidewalk ordinance in Metro and believe that it's the right thing to do for walkability and pedestrian safety throughout all of Nashville. In this case, that already exists on this street and also on the corner on 10th. The concern that we have about removing the existing sidewalk, which is in complete uh, repair, there's nothing wrong with it, the concern we have about removing it and replacing it with the new four foot grass strip and five foot sidewalk is it's, where it's gonna tie into the neighbor, we're now gonna have a jog in the sidewalk. If we look further down the street that's going towards 12th Avenue, there have been three or four new construction homes that have been built and I couldn't find it online, but they have either paid in lieu of or they have well, they've paid in lieu of or granted a variance because those dwellings are done, certificate of occupancy is issued, and they still have the two-foot grass strip and the four-foot sidewalk. Well, they could have been built before the sidewalk bill passed, too. Uh, no, sir, the one was CO'd within the last two months. Okay. Well, then, okay. Yeah. So, so our concern is that in paying lieu of, there is already a neighborhood with a very walkable, safe sidewalk. If we continue down this path of now requiring the four foot and the five foot, Summit Street alone will have a sidewalk that will meander back and forth, back and forth, and we believe this is not in the interest of public safety. Are you opposed to contributing to the in lieu fund? Are you asking that we lift that requirement? The reason that we ask that you lift that, being that it's a corner lot, the pay in, in lieu fund is a $40,000 bill. To build the sidewalk is a $6,000 bill. So we're gonna build the sidewalk. But as we looked at building it, we're concerned that it's not gonna be the walkable, safe neighborhood it used to be by doing the right thing. So a wider, bigger sidewalk makes it a less walkable neighborhood? Uh, yes, especially since we've required as a state years ago to have at, cross, at crossings a handicap ramp with a rumble strip for folks that are visually impaired. If we have a sidewalk coming down Summit that is now going to meander left to right, left to right, left to right, I can't see how that's in the interest of public safety. <coughs> so if we, you're saying that it would cost you $6,000 to build this sidewalk to current standards. That's correct. And the in lieu fee would cost you 40,000. That's correct. Okay, so why didn't you just build the sidewalk? To, you, so you just really think this zigzag does not make it, it's a safety issue. That's correct. Okay, so, okay. questions? Did you talk to your council person about these concerns? We have a letter. Yes. yes. And, and what, did he, letter. what did Councilman Sledge say? Councilman Sledge said no, he would like the sidewalk to go in. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. That's we, what he we, basically says uh, he, to deny the request. We got an email from him. We completely understand the rules and we're, we're prepared to put the sidewalk in. However, looking at 
either a variance has been granted and or they paid in lieu of at homes that have already been reconstructed within the last year, we're concerned that we're now gonna have a neighborhood that is literally gonna just move and, and back what, and forth. What planning would say eventually they will all connect because everyone will build them up to the new codes. I understand, but that has not been done. Yes, okay, any other questions? Anything else to add? We're gonna close the public hearing discussion. I think there's a very simple one, sidewalk bill, councilman's against it, you know, that's just, you no. Know, he has the option of either building the sidewalk, as he said he could build for $6,000, or paying to the in lieu fund based on the frontage of this lot. So, you know, for that reason, I'll go ahead. Uh, no, I appreciate the concern uh, that he cites regarding what will happen when the sidewalks are built to code, but I have to defer to uh, both planning and the council member on that. Was your statement a motion? Yeah, I was, was just saying Second. that we deny the motion and that he be required to comply with the sidewalk requirements. I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. John Michael. Thank you. Next case for the board's consideration is 2018-038. The appellant is Joshua Bronlewy. He's also the owner of the property located at 905 47th Avenue North in Council District Number 20, the nation's neighborhood. This is uh, right at the intersection of Illinois and 47th, shown here in the aerial map. In conjunction with the uh, construction of a single family residence, this is a request for a variance from the sidewalk requirements in the R6 zoning district. The site plan submitted shows, and this is more to the north or upper portion of the site plan, the house that is being constructed from our right recent site visit here at the intersection of 47th and Illinois. And this photograph up 47th in the upper left hand corner, down uh, back westbound or outbound on Illinois to the lower right hand corner. The property now under construction. Very well. You have a late filed letter from the council member on this matter. If it's not in front of you at the moment, the district council member in District 20 sent an email indicating her support for the variance request that neither construction nor payment to the fund would be needed at this location due to the existence of um, a sidewalk or sidewalk network at this location. However, you also have input from the planning department that says something pointedly different. Therefore, Mr. Bronway is present. We'll have the opportunity to make the desired presentation to the board. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 38? Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 38? As a result. Those in support, raise your hand. Okay, good, good. Please start. Just introduce yourself by name and address. You have five minutes. Yep. My name is Josh Bronlewy. My address is 40. Please press button. Yep. My name is Josh Bronlewy. My address is 4702 Illinois Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee, 37209. We live in that blue house right next door. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you for your time today and for serving our city and, and for hearing me. Um, so me and my wife, Katie, own the lot uh, right next door to us it, with the greenhouse, and we're building on the back half. Um, and you know, we live right next door and are developing that lot. Um, we're keeping that front house intact and building a single family home on the back half. Um, so we're, we're, we're requesting a sidewalk variance for both the front and side streets because there's already great walkable sidewalks um, in place and three mature 60 to 70 foot trees that would have to be torn down, uh, as you can see in the picture right next to the sidewalk, um, to comply with the new ordinance. So those three 60 to 70 foot trees would have to be torn down um, in order to comply. Um, like John Michael said, we have full support from uh, Councilwoman Mary Carolyn Roberts on this variance for both not rebuilding the sidewalks and uh, not paying the in lieu fee. Um, she's expressed this word of support to both Bill Herbert and John Michael, and you guys have that word as well. Um, just some information about me and Katie. Um, we're just normal homeowners. We're just normal people. Um, we're not a big building outfit. We're not developing dozens of lots throughout the city. Um, we're just normal people. And uh, we purchased so what, the- what are you gonna do with this house when you finish it? So we're renting the front house. Um, and with the back half, with the back house, we are going to uh, put it for sale. Okay. Yep. Um, so we were able to purchase this lot next to us um, last spring before the sidewalk ordinance was passed. Um, our next door neighbors, which we were really good friends with, um, were really gracious to us and gave us the opportunity to decide to buy this lot um, and to purchase it from them instead of them passing it on to a builder um, because we were just concerned that if just any builder came along, they would just develop it 
um, any way they would like, and we just wanted to not see short-sighted short profiteering happen on our lot. We wanted it to be developed well, and so that's why we kind of wanted to take charge of it. Um, so we were just graciously able to, to purchase this lot from our neighbors, um, which we probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to if it had gone on market. Um, so we were really fortunate in that way. Um, So this is a huge personal risk for us. We're not a big builder. We don't have a bunch of builds to mitigate this kind of contingency across. Um, this is it for us. This is a huge risk personally, financially, all of the above. Um, yeah, so our plan, like I said earlier, to keep the front house intact um, and develop the back half of the lot. Um, so a variance. Uh, from for both the front and the side streets makes sense um, for so, for many reasons. Uh, like I said earlier, the 60 to 70 foot trees, three of them on the side would have to be ripped up. And on the front lot that's on Illinois Avenue, um, the sidewalk would be the zigzag like we've been hearing about. Um, so it would be a four foot setback from the street, but then all the way would go four feet the other way out to the street literally right next to it. So it would be a walking hazard. It would make it less walkable for pedestrians. Um, I think it'd be a burden. And removing the trees would be a burden on pedestrians because they provide canopy shade, um, which the nations needs a lot of. We don't have many, um, uh, many mature trees that provide shade for people. Um, so yeah, like I said earlier, our councilwoman, Mary Kellen Roberts, has come to our side um, in full support of this variance. Um, she unfortunately was not, be, uh, was not able to be here in person today, um, but she is standing by our side with this. Um, so why not pay into the in lieu fund? Uh, because she passed this law. And she, the law she, that has she passed it and how she and every and other council for person it. voted for it said yeah. you either build a sidewalk or yeah. you pay into the in lieu fund. So our situation is uh, special like, once again because we are a corner lot. So the footage is now, 210. We, you sat through our meeting. You, we've yeah. heard from a corner lot person today. Yep. And we will probably hear from others. So everyone thinks their case is special, but this is pretty common now yeah. in this growing city of ours. Yep. Um, so like I said, she put this law into place, and I talked with her earlier today, and she understands that it's a very wooden, rigid ordinance that doesn't take into account uh, different situations like me and my wife's personal situation where we're not a big builder and can't mitigate this kind of cost across a bunch of builds. This is it for us. This is a huge personal financial risk. We have a lot of, but a lot on the line this. this rear property, couldn't you just stick the price of? So we purchased it last spring before the ordinance was in place mm -hmm. and all the numbers make sense according to that kind of scenario and not this updated scenario. We didn't even know about the ordinance until our builder went to pull the permit in November. So we had no, absolutely no idea that this was even gonna be on the tape. I remember him giving a, me a call saying, hey, are you sitting down? Because I have some news, like you need to be sitting down to hear this. Like, so he told us about the sidewalk thing. So we had no idea when we purchased the lot and had this kind of scenario in, in mind with the ability to sell the back half. So it's, a, it's just a lot of money for um, a personal investment and we're not, we're not builders. We don't have, we can't mitigate this across a bunch of builds. Okay. I want to ask a question. I want to make sure I understand. You live in the house that looks blue in this picture. Mm -hmm. You're going to rent the smaller white house and sell the one that's obviously under construction. Is yes. that true? Yep, that, that's correct. You live in that two-story house? Mm-hmm, yep. Anything else to add? Um... Yeah, I would just like to reiterate that Mary Carolyn is on our side on this one. She understood the law when she passed it. She understood it was, um, and she now understands that it's rigid and um, and wants to, to find ways to make exceptions where uh, it's fair and equitable to those people involved. And she truly believes with her heart that this is a case. That's why she's given us a word of support and is by our side on this. I have one more question. Do you know what kind of trees they are, those three large trees? Yeah, um, I believe at least two of them are hackberries, and I think one is an oak. I'm not sure, though. Okay. Not 100% on that. Thank you. We're going to close the public hearing discussion. Can you support me? Oh, yes, you can come forward. 
we have two minutes left, so that's all you got. All I'll need. So, hi, my name is Timothy Brown. I live at 5303A Kentucky Avenue in the Nations. Um, I sit among, on the uh, Planning and Zoning Committee of the Nations Association. And although we did not have an opportunity to review this, um, in other instances, we have supported a, a request such as Mr. Brunnelly's um, to have a variance uh, when there's an existing sidewalk uh, and that uh, if it had come before the nations, I'm sure they would have approved it. But in, then uh, I've spoken with one of his neighbors who's unfortunately out in the hall on the phone and he would say <laughs> that he would support it as an individual. Mm -hmm. And that person is actually the chair of the planning and zoning committee. So that's what I wanted to add. Okay. Thank you. Questions for the applicant or the supporters? Okay. Thank you. Gonna thank you. We're going to close the public hearing. So we've heard a lot of these. We're going to hear some more. We have a sidewalk bill. It was passed unanimously by the Metro Council. We get council people that come in front of us and say, you know, I voted for this, but here is the situation. Let these people out of it. So, so here's what I'm willing to do. <clears throat> I'm willing to grant the variance for the uh, get along 47th Street from the alley to that third large tree. Uh, for the sidewalk and for the in-lieu fee, but the uh, the sidewalk must be built or the in-lieu fee must be paid for the rest of the frontage. That's what I would be willing to do. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. So a little bit more clarity so we will know. So you're saying from what point to what point? From the, from the alley uh, on this plan, I'm assuming north is up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from the, from the alley down to the uh, the second tree. The, 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 well, the, I think there were three trees, three of those large trees. Mm -hmm. In okay. other words, I'm, I'm giving the variance in those, I believe the trees do constitute a hardship. In the tree area, but then after the after trees, that you and then around the, the corner, or paying through the limit. Okay. okay, and that's second, that's, okay. Second. Motion's been made properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, opposed, passes unanimously. Good luck. <laughs> John Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2018-039. Vincent Morelli is the appellant, Pantheon Development, LLC, the owner of the subject property at 114 Lensley Park Drive in Council District Number 6. You heard from uh, the District Council Member Brett Weathers earlier today with regard to this property shown here on the zoning map, an R6 zone property. The aerial, although the pin drop there gives you a little bit of an incorrect identification of the subject property, and this treed area is the area where you start to come in on the subject side, and that's where you see the request for a sidewalk variance. The site plan submitted is not, in fact, a site plan, but an older uh, drawing giving some idea of the orientation of the subject lots. From my recent site visit, the face of the property in the lower right-hand corner and the view across the street in the upper picture. The view up and down Lindsley Park Drive here demonstrates that there is no sidewalk in place anywhere on this street. You have the planning department's recommendation with regard to the sidewalk variance already in your packet. Uh, let's see, the appellant, Mr. Morelli, is present. We'll have the opportunity to make the desired presentation. A preliminary question, is anyone here in opposition to case number 39? Seeing no one, Mr. Morelli have 39. And or, this is a case that Councilman Withers spoke out against too. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Morelli will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Please just state your name and address for the benefit of our record. Thank you, sir. Press the button here. Yes, yes. Uh, press, make sure it's on. Bottom one. There yep. we go. Uh, Vincent Morelli, uh, address uh, 1005 DP Todd Boulevard, uh, Nashville 37208. Okay, so you're asking for a variance from the sidewalk requirements. Why? Yes, so there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one is the slope of the property makes it uh, significantly difficult. And two is, uh, I don't know if you can see on this picture here, but you would have to cut down trees on a couple of different areas. Um, and then lastly, there are no other sidewalks on the street. If you look at a schematic of the uh, lots, there's only uh, a few lots on Lindsley, and those lots um, uh, abut against uh, perpendicular housing uh, on the Holly Street side. So this would essentially be a sidewalk to nowhere, uh, along with the uh, topography and the, um, and the uh, tree cutting issues. Uh, and I apologize, this is my first uh, time going through this. I'm a single 
private house person, so I, I'm not sure the format I should go through, but uh, so I apologize in advance for that. So why is it that you should be exempt from paying into the sidewalk fund? Well, the sidewalk fund is uh, super expensive, and this lot has uh, twice the amount of sidewalk. Um, so it seems like it would be um, just significantly costly and it would be a hardship uh, in this case. Have you gotten an estimate for what it would cost to build a sidewalk? Well, just in hearing the last gentleman here uh, who said it was about $6,000 to build his sidewalk, and the sidewalk fund would cost about $20,000. The rate is $178 per linear foot based upon the rate set by the Metro Public Works Department, so just take the number of linear feet at issue and multiply accordingly. You don't have to estimate. Oh, okay. So that would be then 17,000 feet, or $17,000. But you don't know what it would cost to build a sidewalk. I guess, um, you know. Are you building this house to sell? No. You're going to live here? Yes. Okay. So the council person, and we, you heard him at the top of this meeting, but he also sent us an email saying, the construction of sidewalks is an urgent priority for our county. As co-sponsor of the aforementioned bill that we were talking about, which established the sidewalk requirements that are being appealed, I would support the variance request to enable the applicant to contribute to the sidewalk fund in lieu of constructing a new sidewalks for this lot. So that's what he's saying. Yeah, so he acknowledged, I think he acknowledged the topography as well in the uh, statement, didn't he, or did he not? Well, whether he did or not, you yeah, know, okay. he's saying you could pay into the in lieu fund. Yeah. If you don't want to build the sidewalks as, you know. Right. So, I would say uh, my response to that would be that's not fair. <laughs> uh, just for the fact that there's a excess amount of uh, frontage on but two, different, we heard two from different streets. Corner lots, it just varies. Yeah. Any other questions? So, uh, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You go ahead. Well, I was just noticing that there, we were talking about the fact that there's two frontage. So, which one, which one are you considering the front? Oh, well, there's two. There's one on Lindsley and there's right, one on 15. Right, I understand, but, but do you consider one to be the front, one to be the back? Uh, most likely Lindsley to be the front. And that's, so like 50 feet-ish? Yes. So, John Michael, what, what is, what would you guys normally do? And let him ask Bill about this, because this comes up rarely. <clears throat> Well, I'm confused about what question? this house looks like. This picture doesn't look at all like that picture that ah, I just saw. There's no house. It's an empty lot right now. Uh -huh. So it's it's actually the uh, area behind, well, yeah. Well, on this picture, where are the streets? Which street is which? So it seems like, the, okay, there we go. The, the top, there, there's Lindsley, and on the bottom is 15th. So as you can see, the lot. Uh, that pin on that previous picture was on the, on the wrong property. It was, well, it looked yeah. to be on the I wrong property. It. So it's, it's the strip behind it. Bill, or? So there are no, on. so there are those, uh, there are no sidewalks on either Lindsley or 15th as it stands right now. Okay, hang, hang on one second. Okay. I was gonna ask John Michael or Bill what, what you guys would normally do in a situation like this. Would you would you require them to build on both streets? To the extent it's a question about frontages, the, the language of the ordinance talks about frontages. This is not entirely different from a corner lot in that regard because you do have two, not just an alley, but two actual streets uh, that are touched by this particular piece of property. Of note, this is, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Merrily, it's set up as a horizontal property regime, meaning two uh, housing units constructed on this property. So. Um, Sometimes that helps with clarification as opposed to a traditional single family construction for purposes of the board's analysis. But yes, Mr. Harper, um, you got frontages on both sides. You potentially hit it on, you hit the requirement on both sides. So, so is there a horizontal property regime on, on this property? Or is it going to be one house, two houses? Uh, yes, Just one house. One house? Yeah. That's it? Okay. Yeah. And I'm still not clear where is 15th? 15th is uh, the street street. The, the, the street, uh, let's see, I guess it's directly below Lindsley. So if it's the unmarked street on the side of the no, lot there. The, no, to the left side of the property. Yeah, it's the unmarked street. Right? Lindsley is to the left of the pink 
rectangle, or rather, Lindsley is to the right of the rectangle, 15th is to the left, Holly is to the bottom of the screen. Oh, now, I, I get it now, I didn't, just 15th wasn't marked, thank you. Anything else to add? Uh, no, that's, that's okay. it. Any other questions? Let's close the public hearing. Discussion. So very similar to the last case, we have a sidewalk bill. This is a big lot, and that means the frontage is measured, and it's what, what it is. Can, can you bring up the aerial, please, John Michael? Tell us again in this picture, where is Elkin and where is 50? I mean, where okay, is so Lindsay Park? Okay, so Lindsay. I meant Lindsay Park. Is, is the curved street. That it's got the black Boys patch in the middle. Yeah. yeah, Lindsley is on the, yeah, that's Lindsley right there. And 15th would be on the bottom, half. yeah, right there. What the appellant refers to as the bottom, staff refers to as the left. The that's pin right. is uh, in the lowest left-hand corner of the subject lot, hence creating some of the confusion with regard to the structure you see on the next parcel down. It's the undeveloped parcel there in the middle. Okay, discussion. I'm still a little unclear as to why it was listed as a horizontal property regime in the permit application if he's talking about building only one house. That might matter. It matters a lot. <clears throat> John Michael, is that? The building permit application specifically identifies to construct two single family homes, parcel owners Pantheon development, sidewalks required for both, uh, hence the setup as a horizontal property regime. Although Mr. Morelli may in fact be the owner of only one of the two, the overall project is for a horizontal property regime and two units on the appropriately zoned property. Uh, I may be able to clarify that. This was a lot that I bought from, uh, from the builders, uh, Parthenon, Pan Pantheon builders. So I own that, I own the lot now. Discussion. I just don't see that we can exempt him from the in-lieu fee. I mean, I, I regret the way that it gets applied to single-family homes and independent owners, but I think my position would be that if we grant the variance, he pays into the in-lieu fee, in-lieu in fund. Okay, any other discussion? Also, I'm big on the dedication of the right-of-way. I mean, I think that's something that when people build all over Nashville, that happens. I know everyone else, or a lot of you are don't agree with that, but I think our attorney has spoken about that in the past. Say that again. <laughs> about the, um, when you develop a property, then um, people dedicate right of way as part of a developmental. Yes, you can you explain are, it better. There is case law out there to support the um, requirement of the dedication of right of way if it's part of a you know, a sidewalk scheme, for example, basically this ordinance um, that's related to the public utility. It's, and there is case law out there. This is something that could potentially be litigated by the courts with respect to our specific sidewalk ordinance, but there is case law to support the requirement, the dedication of a right of way when it comes to um, public utility. You know, you've got in potentially increased traffic. This might counteract that. So there are different factors that could be weighed. Okay. So motion, anyone? Well, because he has stated publicly he's only building on one, he's only building one home. Um, at this, at, at well, this the public time, hearing I'm, is closed. Oh. Well, Unless you, you can go to. ahead. Okay. I was going to say, uh, at this time, that's that's all I'm planning at on building. At this time, so you yeah. control the other lot then? Well, it's only one lot. It would have a way. He could build two. You could build yeah, two. I, could, I, I guess essentially I could I could build two at a later point. Okay, but now you're just doing one. Okay, that's right. does that answer your question? He's building one now, but he could build two. It, it does. Um, I was going to suggest he pay the in-lieu fund for just one property frontage, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's something that can be flagged for this property if he builds. I doubt it. I'm looking over at John, and he's not looking. 
the board has the ability to pin conditions on um, motions for approval. If you, if the board saw fit to make a condition that only one property would require payment into the fund, the other would be varied, then that is an option. I would note I, that. The I think what she's saying is if he builds later, then he gets, has to pay for that one. Um, well, he's already triggered to uh, either pay or build on the second. If he builds the second with that frontage, I would note, and I'll submit to the zoning administrator or legal counsel, because this is one lot, both frontages are in play for this project. So I think you have to make a determination on both frontages at this time, rather than punting to the yeah, prospect that, of a later That answers referral. our question. So we can't say in the future he has to pay. Of note, the project is already eligible to make a payment into the sidewalk fund, unlike the slight majority of the cases that you see. I think that's noted in the planning department's recommendation and uh, cited as one of the bases for their okay. recommendation of disapproval. With that being said. I guess the motion is to disapprove the variance request. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? We'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. John Michael will take a five minute break. The board will take that short break and reconvene with tw case number 2018 after that break.
All right, Mr. Chairman, we'll gavel back in for the Board of Zoning.